Welcome back to Adam Sarwatari Extreme. Batteries are a constant battle for me. With so many vehicles in the fleet, there's always batteries going dead, batteries need to be replaced, vehicles need to be jumped. In the older vehicles, it's much easier to identify a battery problem. Typically, you open the door, the dome light doesn't work, or you go to start it and it just won't start. The difficult part is the newer vehicles. Now the exception to that rule, of course, is like I explained to you on the NSX blower motor. I've never seen anything like that in all the vehicles I've worked on. But in the newer cars, things are much more difficult. Now, not to bore you and take a lot of your time as far as batteries, but specifically there's really two types of popular batteries. The older technology is flooded acid battery, lead plates, flooded with acid, pretty self-explanatory. The new trending battery is AGM, absorbent glass material, where it uses the layers of the glass with the lead. The acid is absorbed into the material. That's supposed to be the hot ticket these days. Just a quick note on that, I have noticed that the AGM batteries seem to hold up better when they're discharged completely and last a little bit longer, but I'm not so sure that it's worth the cost differentiation. You'd have to look at that pretty close. And a lot of times, not all the times, but most of the times, AGM batteries use virgin lead. So getting on that topic, whether you're gonna use flooded or AGM, the most important thing is to ask when you're buying the battery, is it virgin lead? Most of the batteries I source from Interstate, but a lot of those batteries no longer use virgin lead, they're recycled, and the lead content is less, so they last, their lifespan's even shorter. So when you're going to shop for your battery, the best advice I can give you, whatever battery you choose, virgin lead will give you a lot better life out of the battery before you have to replace again. And as you all know, batteries are just getting more and more expensive because all the environmental regulations are just crushing them, like everyone else. So, I think the battery issue of having problems in the newer cars specifically kind of come down to two specific reasons. One we just talked about, the batteries aren't as good. They have a lot less lead content. The second being, all of the computers in the new cars are just drawing a ton of power. So it seems like a lot of the cars are virtually near the edge of what the output of the alternator puts and also the power supply of the battery. I've worked on a few cars that actually if the battery will get disconnected, the alternator no longer supports enough power to run the car. The car is dependent as using the battery as like a storage facility in conjunction with the alternator to work. So these are places that you definitely want to look. Now, in working on the newer cars, I see all sorts of weird electrical problems. Things that don't work, things that don't function right. And I will tell you that about 50% of the time, it is always the battery. So it's the best place to start. So that's why I wanted to give you this information. So we'll kind of go over some information on testing the battery, identifying what's going on, and then also what I'll do, I'll take the time to go ahead and do a battery change or information on a battery change. I won't completely change it, but I'll pull everything apart so you can see it on the Mercy because staying specifically on supercars, for some reason, all of them are very difficult to change the battery. This is just one example, but they just don't have the batteries in the conventional places like the normal type cars where you just open the hood, you find the battery location and you swap. All of these supercars, they put the batteries in difficult places and the battery swap jobs are much more difficult. You'll remember in the NSX video, I advised all of you that it's a great idea to have a voltmeter and a scope if you're gonna be working especially on OBD1 cars. Scopes are rather pricey, so at the least if you could get a voltmeter, it allows you to diagnose quite a bit of things just on your own, and it's great to have for all sorts of other applications as well. You can pick them up at Harbor Freight. They're very, very affordable. Now, the only thing with batteries is, is that the problem is the voltmeter may read at 12.1, 12.4, but the battery itself may be no good. There's really no way to tell if the battery is good without testing it. You'll need a battery tester. So here at the shop, we have two kinds of testers. Of course, we have the more expensive snap-on tester that, of course, a lot of my high-end customers all want to see me use. You plug in the information, it's got a printout. It has all the bells and whistles. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. This right here is more of the original, old-school technology, low tester, really affordable. You can get them at any auto parts store. I would advise if it's, you're just gonna be using it on occasion, this is the way to go. But they are very handy to have because, especially since batteries are always typically a problem these days, if you have one of these around, it'll allow you to test yourself. 
it is difficult to hook everything up and do the tests in the car. So I set this up as an example so you know exactly how it works. I have an AGM battery sitting there and it's rated at 650 cold cranking amps. You can see down below that I have a block of wood. For all of you that remove your battery or have a new battery, most of you already know this, but don't set it on the ground because it grounds out the battery and actually discharges it. So after the test is run here, we can kind of take a look and see what it's got. Good battery, recharge, 12.4 volts, and the cold cranking amps is somewhere at 715. With the load tester hooked up, all of them have different instructions, but this one you load test it for 10 seconds. You can see right here, it's actually got a standing voltage of about 12.8. It's reading a little bit higher than the snap-on, but everything else is pretty much in line. When I load tested it for 10 seconds, it came back with also right around 750 cold cranking amps. So you can see that this more affordable unit will definitely give you a good idea of whether or not you need to replace or not. When you have the clamps disconnected from your battery at any time, it's a good opportunity to clean the terminals. Continuity is extremely important. You can get one of these at any auto parts store. It's very, very affordable as well. You just put it on the terminal like this, spin it around, then go ahead and pull it off. You can see the difference after it's cleaned and before. Then usually with inside the cap, you pull it off. Right there is a brush. This, of course, you can use to clean the clamp. On my older cars, when not in use for extended periods, I like to disconnect the battery. That's, I still will have to put a tender or something on it to maintain it, because over time it will actually discharge. The problem is the newer cars. The newer cars that require readiness monitors for emissions testing, they have a battery contained in the car or the ECU, but over time that cell goes bad. So when you disconnect your battery, if you lose that storage, then the readiness monitors will go up to no, which means basically you have to drive around until you meet the requirements again so you can be emissions tested. That is not a huge problem on daily drivers because you're driving and you'll be in the situation where you'll meet the requirements. But I don't really think any of you want to be driving your supercars around and putting miles on just to meet the readiness monitors. So in that situation, you want to keep the battery alive and healthy as long as possible to try and minimize that headache. For me, I use battery tender. I've used the more affordable units. A lot of them will work with no problem. Just be careful that they don't overcharge. You can save some money there. I know for sure, though, that the tender works. And I use the 1.25 amps. I haven't had any problems with these. Now, you'll see a lot of these type of chargers, which basically, they deal with the sulfation process, which typically starts around 12.4 volts. Sulfates build around the plates, the conductivity is reduced, and the batteries don't work as good. That is really what knocks out the batteries. These type of things, battery minder, they're all supposed to reverse the process. They're more expensive. I have not had any luck with these. Hopefully some of you had, but something to consider. So these out of the options are probably the best way to go with, but I do recommend you have some sort of charging process involved, keeping the battery in the best shape possible. A big frustration I always have is finding the lift points and looking in the owner's manual is always very difficult to distinguish where it's at. So hopefully this will help you. You can see both front lift arms go right behind the wheel well. On the rear, there are two locations that I use. The first being more towards the rear. That provides more stability. If you're gonna be working on anything in the suspension or you're gonna be pulling on the car, that's the best place to be. However, if you're going to be changing the oil, this plug is the plug to the oil tank. And if the arm is there, you cannot access it. Therefore, this would be the best location to go with. The rear passenger has no obstructions. So that location right there, more towards the rear tire, is the best for stability. The Mercy battery is located in here. To gain access, we're gonna need to remove the rear driver's side tire and then open up the fender liner. Before we go up in the air, the first thing we wanna do is brake all the stud lugs with a 19 millimeter half inch drive. We'll pull all the stud lugs out by hand and pull everything back carefully with a rotary lift. The first thing you want to do is go ahead and remove the duct that draws cooling air for the manifolds. There's a 10 millimeter bolt on the top and down below on bottom, you can see there's two Torque 25s. You go ahead and remove these and then go ahead and pull out the duct. The next thing we wanna do is pull the fender liner 
use a 10 millimeter socket. There's a bolt right here. There are five total torque 20. One, two, three, four, and five. To pull the fender liner piece out, just turn, twist inward and up, then pull in and out. Now we have access to the battery. We can use a 10 millimeter socket and go ahead and pull this nut to loosen the negative clamp and pull it off. Then of course, again, use the 10 millimeter on the positive clamp and pull the clamp off. Then we can hook up the battery tester, check our results and see what you decide to do. At that point as well, it's a very good time whether or not you're going to change the battery to clean the clamps. If the battery's gonna stay, then I would clean the terminals and you can put it all back together. If your findings are that you need to change the battery, then at that point, of course, you wanna push the clamps out of the way. You'll see right down here is the battery hold down. 10 millimeter socket, you can pull that right up. I will admit, it is a bit of a fight to get the battery out of there, but not extremely bad. Pull it out, you can change it out, put your new one up, and close it all up again. It's difficult to see the battery label, but I went with an MTP-48 forward slash H6A. It is a flooded acid battery. I went with a flooded acid over the AGM because it had a higher rating. Your car is not gonna know whether or not you're using flooded acid or AGM. So I suggest you use the highest amount of power that you can get. Put the fender liner piece back in. Once the panel's lined up, send back in the bolt with the 10 millimeter socket. And then of course, cinch down the five torque screws that are holding down the panel. Now we're ready to install the duct that cools the exhaust manifolds. With the exhaust manifold duct in place, we'll go ahead and tighten down the top bolt with our 10 millimeter socket. Then we'll go down below to the two Torx 25 screws. I don't believe I need to tell any of you this, but all this is plastic. I'm sure you know this, everything's quite delicate, but especially these two Torx 25s, you wanna be very careful you don't over tighten because it will crack. Now that everything's closed up, we'll bring the wheel up and snug down all the stud lugs in a cross pattern. Bringing the car down, we wanna just go ahead and lightly load the suspension. Then we wanna go ahead and re-tighten the stud lugs again in a cross pattern. Cinch them down pretty good for a final time before torquing. Now we can completely load the suspension and torque down the wheels to a final torque spec of 90 foot-pounds. Whether you're changing the battery in the Mercy or another vehicle, if you have the skill set, there's a potential to save quite a bit of money on the labor, and also you won't pay the markup that you'd pay at the dealer or at an independent on the battery. This also gives you time to research and go through everything that is out there and available. Everyone has their own opinion on batteries. So just check into it and the direction will become clear what's best for you. I hope you found this video informational and it will help you. See you next time.